Good morning, welcome to day three. And I'm very excited about our upcoming keynote right now. Um, as those of you who saw my morning talk yesterday, um, you probably realize and know that I focused heavily on this theme, that in the next five to 10 years, our industry will be defined by applications derived from satellite produced data or EO data. And there's one singular company that I generally point to that exemplifies this trend, it's Orbital Insight. So it's my honor to actually introduce James Crawford, Jimmy Crawford today, the CEO of Orbital Insight. Um, in fact, I've been a fan of their company for quite some time, and I actually joke with folks at the company that I've been a fan of their company even before their company started. Um, I kept talking about their business model, hoping someone would actually realize that business model. I'm glad Jimmy and their team is doing it. So uh, without further ado, um, the next 10 years of the space industry kind of rests on your shoulders, Jimmy, so no pressure. It's my honor to introduce James Crawford. Please come on up. All right, thanks very much. So, it's one of our uh, sub-themes of the company, Count the Trees, See the Forest. I think by the time I'm through speaking, this, this quote will make perfect sense to everybody. So this is a famous picture. This uh, picture was taken when, when, when in the 60s when the Apollo spacecraft was on the way to the moon. And it really changed the way a lot of people thought, because it started us all thinking of the Earth as a fragile, uh, almost terrarium containing life. And, and you sort of look at that and you think, you know, I can sort of see everything about the Earth in this picture. And in a sense, you can. All the continents are there, all the clouds are there, all the weather's there, all the agriculture is there. But the catch is that when you zoom the Earth out to this point, you're seeing 100 square kilometers per pixel, um, which, is, which is actually an really way too coarse to actually, in a way, see anything. I mean, all you're going to see is the very largest climactic events, you know, hurricanes, you know, massive um, dust storms, massive desertification. What we need instead is to actually see much, a much more granular level. And the good news is that thanks to all of our partners on the satellite side and some of the people in this room and a lot of our friends, we now actually have a tremendous number of satellites. Um, our colleagues at Planet claim that they now have the whole Earth every day. Um, there's actually a story in uh, Bloomberg Business Week this week about, about Planet and all they've accomplished and the rest of New Space. Um, and there has been a tremendous amount done. Um, you know, we've got new satellites going up from Digital Globe and from Airbus and from, and from a whole host of other startups and multiple um, resolutions and multiple spectral bands. Um, some of them very large, some of them very, very small. Now, the challenge this creates is that you end up with so many images that you're, you basically overwhelm the humans that have been looking at the images. So we have been in a paradigm, basically going back to the 60s when, when satellites were rare and expensive, where the analysis, once an image comes down to Earth, is done by humans. And in the, in the old, old days, they literally parachuted the film out of the satellites. And, and you can pretty much assume there was very few satellite images. Um, but nowadays, we did a calculation, and with all the startups that are, that are coming into being and all the launch plans, within a couple of years, you would need 8 million people, the entire population of New York City, doing nothing but staring at satellite images all day, every day, in order to make sense of those images. Fortunately for us, there, the, there's another new kind of hardware out there beyond just satellites. This is something called a graphical processing unit. Um, these were actually designed so that um, teenagers could play first-person shooter games, basically. It's, it's, it's a highly parallel architecture that lets you actually separately compute the um, state of each pixel on the screen in parallel so that you can actually render very complicated scenes very, very quickly um, for computer gaming and other applications. Um, what the AI community realized, what, five, 10 years ago, was that you can actually essentially run these things backwards. You can turn them into neural networks, or, or actually run neural network algorithms on them, and use the same kind of parallelism to <coughs> highly parallelize the process of, of processing images. So one of the things we've done at Orbital Insight is bring these two ideas together. So we've been making extremely heavy use of GPUs and other multispectral techniques 
to process satellite images. So we now have the ability to detect, detect buildings, to detect trucks, to find oil tanks, to measure the size of their shadows and thus how much oil is in them, to find houses, to find roads, to find railroad cars, to classify land use into fields versus forest versus urban, to find ships, to find airplanes. Basically, this now gives us the ability to, to profile the images at scale um, and at, literally at a worldwide scale. We've, we've run our t um, oil tank finding algorithms over literally the entire Earth, the, all the land surface of the Earth, and found all the oil tanks. Um, we've been running our car counting algorithms all over the U.S. and other places and counted more than three billion cars. And this is what lets us, this combination of massive increases in the number of satellites and massive improvements in AI is what lets us um, actually make progress on understanding the Earth and, and understanding the Earth in new ways. So you can do some things which are, um, which are sort of give you a sense of the power of this. Um, look at all the cars in London, for instance. Um, so we took an image of, of uh, actually a series of images of London, ran car detectors, and here, since we're zoomed out so far, we're just showing all the cars as dots, right? But you can see basically the street pattern, the grid pattern of the streets, location of the rivers, location of the parks all basically falls out of the car detector algorithm, which is really kind of interesting. And then, of course, you can do more serious applications, um, such as looking at retail trends. So we're currently tracking on the, on the um, for some of the, our Wall Street customers, um, 100 U.S. retail chains. These are folks like Best Buy, Target, Walmart, Costco. Um, and we'll, first we figure out where all of their locations are, the exact latitude and longitude of all of their locations exactly the shape of their parking lot, and that's mostly human work. And, and that's characteristic of what we do very often. We need to do um, a, set, a, a number of setup steps that are very manual. And then once those setup steps are done, then it's completely automated then, and it, all these algorithms run nightly with, with um, no human involvement besides the DevOps guys. And so, you know, the satellite images come in here from folks like Digital Globe and Airbus. Um, we, we cut out all the parking lots that we care about, which is now up to about 200,000 total parking lots, run the algorithms automatically, update the counts for all the relevant chains, and then send that back out to our customers um, uh, the next morning. And this is in contrast to, say, an SEC report, which comes out at the end of the quarter. Actually, it comes out three to four weeks after the end of the quarter. So we're, we're massively ahead of that data. Um, we don't 100% match that data because there's more to sales than just the number of cars in the parking lot, but it's a, it's a nice um, independent objective indicator that comes in, as I say, very early as to how these retailers are all doing. Um, and, and for the folks in this room that are launching satellites, the number one thing we need to make, these, um, to make this data better and be able to charge more for it is um, more satellites in the one meter range. Um, we're sort of sucking up all the images we can get in the one meter range for this project and we still need more because, because we would ideally like to monitor all of these stores every day or multiple times, ideally multiple times a day for all of these stores. And then, we'd, would, this, then, would, then this would lock in even better than it does. But even today, we're getting good traction. We've got um, nice results. We've got folks like JP Morgan and others actually writing now some of their um, reports um, based on our data. We can show over the long term. And one of the nice things about the, the um, archive that we now have from folks like Digital Globe is that we can go back as far as 2011, 2012, and actually show car counts um, and, and show um, how that relates to the stock price and how in certain cases we're, we're able to anticipate um, what later becomes apparent to the analysts on Wall Street and to the traders on Wall Street. But the uh, interesting thing about car density, as I sort of uh, implied with the London pictures at the beginning, is that, is that it's not just about retail. You can actually use it for much larger pattern of life analysis. So in this case, um, as, an ex as an early exercise, we actually downloaded all the imagery we could get from the satellite providers of Nanjing, China. And, just, we, and then we actually used open street maps to, to segment out the roads. And then we did a density um, over the five years that we had data for. And you can actually see as you would expect, how the traffic grows out from the center. I'm sure if you did the same thing for San Francisco, you would see 101 getting worse and worse. Um, and, and we see this in, in most cities in the world that we've, that we've looked at. You'll see this kind of growth of traffic over the, over the time period and, and movement of traffic into the suburbs. But obviously, the, the applicability of these techniques and these algorithms is, is not limited to just cars. Um, another area 
It's a subject of, of a lot of interest right now is oil. Um, and as you probably know, for a long time, oil was defined, or oil prices was, was pretty much defined by OPEC. So OPEC would state some new policy and suddenly we'd be paying twice as much at the pump for oil. Um, but recently there's been this stubborn tendency of oil prices to not go up and it's been driving OPEC crazy. Um, and it appears that the reason for that is more and more due to U.S. shale production. Interesting thing about that, and, 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 and nobody has been quite sure, none of the analysts have been quite sure how sensitive shale production is to price because the technology for shale production has been improving rapidly. So every time the price goes down, the shale producers figure out how to produce more cheaply and they keep producing and keep making money. And that's also part of what's driving OPEC crazy. Um, and so our role in this is um, just to figure out what's actually going on. Um, so we can see all the oil tanks. Um, most of the oil tanks for crude oil use what, what are called these floating lids, um, where the lid actually sits on the surface of the oil. So if you can imagine this oil tank, the lid sits on the oil. As the tank fills up with oil, the lid goes up. As the, as the oil is pumped out, the lid goes down. And looking from above, you can actually see the sun's shadow that's cast by the sides of the tank onto the roof of the tank and use that to measure the, the total capacity of the tank as well as the amount of oil in the tank. In places like the US, there is, there is weekly data that's pretty good and we're able to get a good correlation with that data. Oops, I went the wrong way. When you go someplace like China, um, there's not really great data. Um, there's some government data that the traders don't really believe. And indeed, um, when we ran our algorithms to find oil tanks across all of China, we found about 200 million barrels of oil storage capacity that, that wasn't in any of the Bloomberg or Thomson Reuter or other analyst databases and wasn't really being tracked, wasn't really captured in any of the data out there. We slightly moved the world oil market when we put this out. Um, and now that we're tracking, although we haven't released any of the data yet, we're tracking the Middle East, we're tracking Europe. Um, we basically have in our own databases all the oil tanks in the world. It gives us an ability to actually see where the crude oil is, see how much is coming out of the fracking in the U.S., how much the Chinese have been building up their oil storage capacity pretty aggressively while the price has been low. And so we're able to see that happening. We're able to see how much OPEC is really cutting back on production. So it gives a, it gives a much more objective picture of what's going on with oil and oil storage capacity and oil storage capacity use. Um, and again, as with the cars, the, the biggest limitation here, of, of, well, there's two limitations of this data set. Um, since you guys are a, a space audience, there's two important limitations of this data set. One is we still don't, in, until we get a little bit more from planet, we still don't have all the oil tanks every day. And even when we've got the planet data, we don't have all the oil tanks every day because the, um, there's some areas with a lot of oil tanks that are, tend to be very cloudy. So we're starting to look at using SAR imagery for that. And then the other limitation is that um, some of the oil tanks used for crude oil and all of the oil tanks, almost all the oil tanks used for refined oil like gasoline and diesel are actually fixed lid tanks. And the way you figure out how much oil is in those is by using the thermal camera. Um, and at the moment, the only way to get a thermal camera is to fly drones. So once we get better um, thermal imagery from space or from drones and we get um, better SAR imagery, you know, in a few years, we do see the ability to track literally all the oil tanks every day for, for this entire supply chain, as well as things like refinery activity, drilling activity, fracking activity. So in a completely different area, um, we had a customer that, that came to us and said they wanted to know how quickly China was, shutting, was slowing down their steel production. Um, there's been a, a, a tremendous construction boom in China through about 2014. And during that time, they were producing steel like crazy. And they did it using um, blast furnaces that are relatively open to the air. They're about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, um, extremely hot. And um, so we had a thesis that we would be able to actually see these blast furnaces. And so we actually trained a neural network um, using um, multispectral imagery um, to look at, the right com look at the characteristic combination of spectral bands that indicates a blast furnace. And we were able to show, um, I guess I don't have the, 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 the graph, but we were able to show nice correlations with the best data we could find on steel production in South Korea and China um, by using this uh, blast furnace technique and looking basically at the spectral signature. And all those little, this is, I don't know if you can see the, the years going by on this, but this data is from 2000 to 2017. And each of those little things that looks like a match lighting up and down is actually a huge blast furnace. 
um, lighting up, producing tons of steel, and then being shut down. Um, and so by looking at how many of those are active at any given point, you get a crude but, but accurate measure of the steel production in a region. Um, one other application that I'm actually very proud of, and we're still um, working on uh, moving this forward, is using this data for poverty mapping. So we did a project last year with the World Bank where we had a thesis that we could take some of the um, convolutional neural networks we'd already trained for other purposes and repurpose them for poverty mapping and see if we could get correlations between things that we knew how to measure like car density and building density and, and regional poverty. So the World Bank, our, the team we partnered with at the World Bank had data for Sri Lanka because they had done some house-to-house -house surveys, and those are very expensive. You know, you generally only do those once a decade in most parts of the of the underdeveloped world. And but they had some good data for Sri Lanka, so we did um, agricultural productivity, car density, building density, building height, and found some nice correlations against the poverty data. And so this year we're we're doing all of Mexico, and that one also is looking pretty good. Um, so the hope is that over time, as we refine this technique we can give them uh, much more effective ways to interpolate between their decadal surveys of where poverty is and how it's moving. In, and because these parts of the world that are most in need of help from folks like the World Bank is the places where, generally speaking, the data is the worst. And more generally, you know, agricultural yield is a, is a great application. And we've shown that the, basically the same techniques for agricultural yield, especially from satellites like, like Landsat and Sentinel, which are free and cover the world, we can actually get um, agricultural yield basically anywhere at this point, um, as U.S. as well as you know less obvious places like Sri Lanka. Finally, one other um, project that I think has potentially really large humanitarian application is water detection, and this is a, a good example um, for people that have been in the field for a long time of of the power of these uh, convolutional neural networks and deep learning. So um, this is um, Lake Adichie in Iraq. If you look at the at the bottom set of images. The middle picture there is actually the Landsat water band. So Landsat includes not only red, green, blue, but also land, the Landsat team's best idea of where the water is. Um, the problem is it's really not very good um, because it's, it's and, and it's no fault of the Landsat team, it was an algorithm that was probably designed 20 years ago before there was deep learning. So our guys basically trained a convolutional neural network using the multiple Landsat bands to find water in the normal way, which is to mark a bunch of images and then have the algorithm learn what water looks like in Landsat. As you can see on the image of the right, it pretty much locks in the water all the time in all the images. And when we did the San Luis Reservoir in California, we have here the dam data against our data, and it tracks nearly perfectly. I mean, if we could do that for car counts against you know, um, revenue of Walmart stores, the guys on Wall Street would, would pay us you know, unlimited amounts of money for the, for the data. So, so we basically have, have water locked in. And this is really interesting because a lot of regions of the world especially in areas like Africa and the Middle East, um, water is a majorly scarce resource, and the ability to basically um, track fresh water in any region accurately is, should, is, a, is, a, is really nice from a humanitarian point of view. So that's um, sort of the, the quick summary of what we've been doing. I think that the, the big picture idea here is that if you take a supply chain um, like the automotive supply chain, you know, we now have communally between all the satellites that are going up and the AI we have available and the analytics, the ability to track mining behavior, shipping of ore, refining of ore, building of cars, storage of cars, sales, the same thing for other supply chains. The image on the right here is shipbuilding, so a very different supply chain, and you can actually see, and here we've actually put together in this little GIF, planet imagery, digital globe imagery, and Airbus imagery, and as time goes by, when the thing restarts from the beginning, you'll be able to see this little boat, we, the little, little boat, the ship we highlighted in green, constructed, starting from the stern, moving up to the bow, and then they build the decks, and then it sails away. So you can actually see things like this in sort of simulated real time, um, and then that goes for shipbuilding, solar plant construction, agricultural harvest, mines, mills, refineries. Um, so that sort of, I think, you know, in a single GIF sort of illustrates the power of what we sort of have created as a community here. And what we're, what we're doing now, as Amaresh Im implied at the beginning, is, is looking at, at how we turn this into commercial value. Um, so we work with um, a, a very large number of, of hedge funds, mutual funds, banks, as well as government agencies and, and other folks to take this kind of insight 
and understand how it can be used to make corporations more efficient, investment more efficient, insurance more efficient, government more efficient. So hopefully that's helpful. And you wanna take some time for questions or what's your schedule like? Let's see. Questions, yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you, you saw a need in the, the range of like one meter uh, capable satellites, uh, but for particular for your, your parking lot uh, idea. So uh, it, do you think that's, the, that's where the big gap is right now in one meter for all, across all applications, or, or would you say that there's some need in, in other sized imaging? That's a good question. So um, one interesting thing about, about human civilization is that, is that for some combination of, of, because of some combination of historical reasons, all the major vehicles we use, whether they're trucks, cars, rail, or rail cars, are all about the same width. Um, and so that width turns out to be, I don't know what, three meters or so. So one meter turns out to be a good resolution, or maybe 0.70 centimeters to one meter, turns out to be a good resolution to find objects of about that width. And, and those objects, whether it's shipping containers, trucks, cars, tend to be of commercially high importance. So that's definitely a sweet spot. It's not the only sweet spot. Um, we can do a lot with, with just Landsat resolution. Um, we can do a lot with planet resolution. Um, but, um, but there's definitely um, things, and, and, and I, I highlight the one meter because I think we're already getting a ton of imagery at the sort of Landsat resolution and at the planet resolution. And, and it's when we have to go down to the level of counting individual cars, individual trucks that we, that we start to run into a little bit more of limitations in terms of the number of images we can get. Mm -hmm. Here in the middle aisle, uh, just graduated from ASU, and one of our projects was doing a business case scenario of millimeter wave sensing on CubeSats for a similar okay. implementation like Planet has. Uh, millimeter wave is really good for getting cloud data, weather data, let alone uh, navigation at, on sea. Uh, so my big interest is if at any given point, 60% of the data that's coming down from space is ruined by clouds, mm -hmm. how will weather insights uh, change the game once we get that infrastructure up there to be able to pierce through the clouds, let alone see the clouds themselves when it comes to agriculture and insurance, perhaps? Yeah, so um, clouds are a big deal. Um, the um, fact that, I mean, I can give you a couple examples where clouds are a problem. One of the, one of the places where clouds are a problem is ports are, are major drivers of economic activity. And they're also areas of major interest for uh, governments, obviously, because that's where stuff comes in and out of countries. And so the fact that yeah, many ports in the world are 80% cloud covered because they're right where the land and the water meet. So um, being able to actually pierce through the clouds and see the ships and the shipping containers and the trucks and the ports will be a huge deal for, for commercial purposes as well as government purposes. Knowing exactly where the clouds are is not quite as helpful. Right? What we really need to be able to do is see through them. So I think the big, the big advance there will be more on the SAR side, synthetic aperture radar, where we can actually get through the clouds and actually um, accurately figure out you know, ship counts, car counts, shipping container counts, um, even in the presence of clouds. Um, the other area, as you mentioned, is agriculture, um, because a lot of regions where you're growing crops, you grow them there because it rains a lot, and that's why you grow there. And being able to get um, accurate early season yield, yield forecasts is, is, relies upon being able to see through the clouds. Um, the, the third area that's, that's, um, that we've talked to a number of folks about is disaster response and insurance. So if you want to understand flooding, for instance, you want to understand the impact of major floods. Generally, major floods are associated with major rains, which are associated with clouds. And so being able to get accurate pictures when the water is at its highest right after a flood is obviously going to work a lot better if you have SAR so that you can actually photograph any time whether there's, whether there's clouds or not and whether it's day or night. Mm -hmm. Time we have for questions. Okay. okay, so that's the end of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.